The 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar should be a joyous celebration of soccer. Over a billion people will tune in to experience the most watched sporting event in the world. But hidden from all those eyes, the thousands of migrant workers who have suffered, had their wages stolen, and even gave their lives so that the government of Qatar could showcase to the world its version of the beautiful game. The Forgotten Dead, the Migrant Workers of Qatar. This story of greed, corruption, and human rights abuses begins 12 years ago. In 2010, soccer's international ruling body, FIFA, awarded the rights for the 2022 World Cup to Qatar. It was a controversial decision. Not only had much larger countries been in the running, Qatar was under fire for human rights abuses. The surprise and joy shown by the Qatari continent might have been false emotion. Many people knew what FIFA's decision was well before the announcement. In 2015, an investigation by the U.S. Justice Department implicated over 20 FIFA executives in a bribery scheme. Countries such as Qatar and Russia were alleged to have paid millions of dollars to get the cup. Make no mistake, the bribes are worth it, in a sense. The prestige of holding a World Cup can't be measured in dollars. And FIFA pays the host country. Qatar will receive around $1.7 billion. Of course, FIFA will take in $7.5 billion, a new record. But Qatar, the host country, had to build all of this. Nine stadiums, 55,000 new hotel rooms, and 20 billion new roads to take 1 million tourists from point A to point B. For this $220 billion infrastructure project, the tiny country of 3 million people would need new workers. Cheap, disposable workers. And those men and women would not come from Qatar. Fresh blood had to be imported in from neighboring countries like Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Pakistan. These migrant workers were brought into a system designed to turn them into modern day slaves, a working system known as kafala. Kafala links migrant workers' visas to the company they work for. The companies have near complete power to hire, fire, and work their employees as they see fit. In Qatar, this means millions of people are there on the power and whim of their employer. Over 85% of the country is made up of migrant workers, and in the months following the announcement that the World Cup would be held in Qatar, those numbers rose quickly. The corruption started right away. To even get a job, workers had to pay illegal recruitment fees. Many companies hired to staff the massive Qatari construction project were all too quick to make an extra buck off of workers looking for a job in the new World Cup site. And construction companies in Qatar made the situation worse by charging recruiters fees that they knew would be passed off to migrant workers. In October 2022, the Human Rights Watch found that many had borrowed money at rates so high that it would take years for them to pay it back, putting them into debt bondage or the modern day equivalent of an indentured servant. But for Qatar's migrant workers, the worst was yet to come. The biggest and most ambitious project of the Qatar World Cup are the stadiums. Eight in all, seven of them brand new. They were built to show off the host country and of course, soccer. Albiet Stadium, which hosts the cup opener. Lucial Stadium, the largest was seating for 80,000 and other magnificent arenas in and around the capital city of Doha. Ahmad B. Ali Education City, Khalifa International, Al Thamama, Al Janoub Stadium 974. Spectators will enjoy these ultra-modern stadiums. Millions all over the world will see them in all their glory, during the cup and for years after in highlights. But very few will see this and living conditions like this. Many of the workers who built these stadiums and still work in them live in conditions like these, jammed by the dozens into windowless rooms, fed rotten food, and not allowed to leave. Their so-called salaries averaged out to $1.20 an hour, and that is after they paid thousands in fees and bribes to even get the manual labor jobs. Why would anyone choose to work under these kinds of conditions? The answer, as always, comes down to money. 
Qatar is surrounded by countries that have some of the poorest people in the world. The host country, on the other hand, is one of the richest countries on the planet, exporting more natural gas than anyone on the planet. Workers who had little to no prospects in their home countries were understandably joyous. The World Cup looked like it would mean the entire region could experience an economic boom. For a worker from a poor country nearby, a new job with a Qatari company meant that their visa was sponsored. They could enter the country and work legally. The temptation was too great. For example, Nepal. Long dwarfed by its neighbors, the superpowers China and India, it has very little work for its citizens. In 2015 alone, Nepal sent about 200,000 workers across the border into Qatar to help build for the World Cup. To even have a chance at one of the manual labor gigs, a Nepalese worker had to borrow the money to pay a recruiting fee. A later investigation found that on average, the fees were $2,000 or 25 times the legal limit. Nepalese borrowed the money at insanely high interest rates, 30% or more. So the first few several months they worked in Qatar, they weren't making a cent. They were working off debt. That put them in an equally vulnerable position. The companies controlled their workers' visas, and whether they could work, stay in the country, they could even prevent them from leaving the country. And many took full advantage by withholding wages or refusing to allow workers to change jobs or even go back home, or by abusing the workers physically or making them work countless hours both paid and unpaid in deathly heat. The workers couldn't complain, they couldn't leave, they couldn't change companies, and they started dying. Qatar is known for its scorching hot summers. During the month of June, the average temperature is 106.2 degrees Fahrenheit or 41.2 Celsius. When Qatar was awarded the World Cup, critics were quick to point out that the championship was played in June and July, a terrible time for football stars to sprint for 90 minutes of the championship soccer match. FIFA had a solution. First, it made sure that Qatar would be constructing stadiums with advanced cooling systems. Second, it moved the entire schedule from the summer to November, December. This rescheduling threw the rest of the world's football schedules into chaos, but no matter. But the players and the spectators would be much more comfortable. The migrant workers building those stadiums, they would have to work those summer months, exposed to deadly heat. The deaths started coming quickly, worked long hours for little pay, under pressure to make sure Qatar gleamed for 2022. Young and healthy workers died by the hundreds. An investigation in 2021 by The Guardian found that almost 7,000 migrant workers had passed away from overwork and dangerous conditions. Many had died from workplace accidents, but hundreds, maybe thousands of young men in particular, had fallen to the heat. Cardiac arrests, heart attacks, respiratory failures, all of these were killing workers. The Nepalese government estimates that over 2,000 workers from its country alone have died since Qatar began building for the World Cup. How could so many die with little to no outcry? How could the World Cup be allowed to even go on? The first and easiest reason to see, the Qatar government didn't count deaths as work-related. It barely registered the migrant workers as people at all. The official death count by Qatari organizers which they limited to deaths on projects directly linked to the tournament, is 37. And they claimed that only three people have died in workplace accidents. Human rights organizations estimate that number is well past 4,000 and may climb higher to 7,000. Where is the government response? For that matter, why hasn't FIFA, with its outsized influence and financial power, done anything? The easy answer is that in the big money world of international soccer, the World Cup is more important than a few thousand migrant workers. But the outcry for the dead finally got loud enough for FIFA and Qatar to respond. Qatari's Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, the group responsible for building the World Cup infrastructure, finally introduced several new plans to compensate workers, allowing for more freedom and better working conditions, and to pay the families of workers who have passed away. 
Of course, all of these new rules will have to be followed, and they weren't even brought up until most of the building for the World Cup had already been finished. World Cup teams from around the globe have protested the treatment of migrant workers, along with Qatar's long history of human rights abuses. And in fact, Amnesty International has called for FIFA, the sports governing body, to help compensate workers for all of the abuses. They asked for $440 million of the $7.5 billion that FIFA will bring in to be set aside. But the month the World Cup began, FIFA President Gianni Infantino sent a letter to the 32 countries that are sending teams to the Cup. In it, he wrote, quote, We know football does not live in a vacuum, and we are equally aware that there are many challenges and difficulties of a political nature all around the world. But please do not allow football to be dragged into every ideological or political battle that exists. Please, let's now focus on football. End quote. The message was clear. Forget the abuses and deaths that went into the making of Qatar's World Cup. Just keep your eyes on the ball.